Welcome to Electrolysis 2.0 in 2022. I hope you have had a very bright start to the year. And if not, then I hope that with this webinar, we can at least kickstart the year for you. Firstly, my apologies for the reschedule. Unfortunately, I fell ill just before Christmas. Um, but thank you very much for accommodating the rescheduling and, uh, and showing up for this event. Now, when I was small, my mother taught me that uh, the best way to share love or let love grow is to share it. And I happen to love high temperature electro electrolysis. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to share that with you today. It's always a difficult task when you want to reach all the way into the corner to really share. So for that purpose, I have brought along one of my very good colleagues, Christian. Christian, do you want to say hi to the audience? Hi, I'm happy to be here. I will explain the technical aspects of our high temperature electrolysis, but first of all, he will give an introduction to the topic. Thanks, Christian. Christian and I go back a long time. We went to university together and uh, we also uh, started in Topsy, more or less at the same time. And I think that tells you two things. Firstly, Denmark is a very small country. And secondly, by now, Christian and I have reached a stage that we considered old when we started back in the day. That has some advantages. You, Growing up in the, at least professionally, in the refining and chemical industry, that teaches you a lot of things. And fortunately, some of these things are still relevant today. And chief among those is efficiency or energy efficiency. I tend to use these two uh, interchangeably. And with efficiency, we mostly, well, we, when we say that we mean how much of your feedstock, of your raw materials, are you able to turn into products? And in, of course, in, in a fossil, that's how much of your natural gas can you convert into, say, ammonia or methanol. And in an electrified scenario is how much of the electrical energy that you receive ultimately ends up as chemical energy in a product. So, our learnings has always been that efficiency has been the, if not the, then at least one of the top uh, factors that gives profitability for a project. And we believe that's not something that is only relevant yesterday. We truly believe that that will be very, very relevant going forward. And ultimately, these electrified projects, they will reach profitability through efficiency. So a bit about Topsy. We uh, perfect chemistry and we do this for a better world. We have been doing this uh, basically since uh, Dr. Haldor or Dr. Taylor Topsy founded the company. And I remember when I joined the company, there was this lovely saying by Haldor that any commercial enterprise only carries significant value if it adds societal value. It's very roughly translated from Danish. But I mean, this has stuck with me ever since. And I think that uh, we actually live up to that in what we do with our focus on, uh, that's a more in the past maybe, but our focus on fertilizers for the developing world and our focus on sulfur and NOx removals from different exhaust gases and different fuel products. And today, of course, that comes into these electrolysis and power to X technologies where we want to, to help solve those issues. When I'm outside of top three, then admittedly, most of the world, they don't concern themselves very much with perfecting chemistry. Currently, sort of one of the major things in the world is electrification. So electrifying the world. And I think that very rightly so. This is, uh, again, if not the, then at least one of the uh, toughest challenges or most important challenges we face in this generation. Uh, and also a very difficult task because ultimately we're talking about restructuring the whole energy uh, network we have in the world, at least for the fuels and chemical area. It's 
it's basically reconstructing the entire industry. That's of course a, a very tough task. But as an engineer, a little bit selfish maybe, but you know, a very exciting times. Now, when it comes to to what we call hard to abate sectors, and, and that's uh, some of the sectors we show on this slide, but really I think the, the a good way of looking at it is that anything that's not relatively easily um, electrified directly, that is an hard to abate sector. And, and these sectors, they are either impossible or at least very cumbersome to, to electrify. So this is where, in our view, perfecting chemistry meets electrification. And ultimately, if you look at it sort of very, sort of in a nutshell, all electrolysis does, the, the contribution of electrolysis is to facilitate an indirect electrification of these sectors. And we do that indirect electrification through chemistry. If, um, if you know these sectors, um, then, then, then you will also know that for these sectors, efficiency is really the mantra that keeps profitability going. And at least our learnings through this has been that that is chief among their concerns, um, among our concerns. And ultimately, in these sectors, electrolysis itself is, is not sort of the chief concern. It's, it's more about how do, um, how do we reduce and ultimately eliminate carbon emissions from these sectors? And how do we do this at such a high efficiency that uh, we have a sufficiently low cost basis for this. So if trying to have a short break here and say the key takeaway, takeaways from the first part of the introduction, then, then really I would say, if you're looking at it, then, then efficiency is, is paramount for, for profitability. And, and more holistically, you can say, then it's efficiency is paramount to, as Bill Gates would say, reaching zero. So reaching a situation with no carbon emissions. Because ultimately we will reach that, but if we efficiently use our electricity, then we will reach it faster than if we don't. So we keep that in mind. Good. Then here on this slide, we've sort of sketched on the left side, different kinds of feedstocks, raw materials. In the second part, the sort of the different ways to convert that into the products you see in the third part. And finally, the fourth is the utilization of these products. And a lot of the focus currently is of course on electrification, but it's also on these hard to abate sectors, how to actually do that. And let's take marine as an example. There we are moving away from the heavy fuel oils and the marine diesels, and we're moving into methanol and ammonia. That in itself is a very large change for the maritime industry and it poses a lot of challenges on ship builds, ship retrofits, fuel availability. But ultimately what we're doing is we are solving the same problem the same type of way even if it is different fuels. Because the new fuels we're making they still solve the same problem, the propulsion of large ships with an energy dense fuel. What we see is that a lot of the really large changes are happening you know, upstream in the feedstock area of this. We have seen these changes happen previously on a smaller scale. So when we shifted away from oil more towards natural gas, or at least relatively speaking, uh, with the coal to chemicals uh, movement in China or even the shale gas in, in the US. So we have some experience from this. And electrification is, of course, a, a larger challenge, but ultimately it is about how do you move from a situation today to a situation with a changing feedstock and how do you then utilize that feedstock in the best possible way. And here sort of talking efficiency, if, if you follow the, the top line through the electrolyzer, there is here an efficiency with how well do you convert the electrical energy into to chemical energy, uh, in this case, hydrogen. And I think the second part of that is how 
well or how efficient do you convert that hydrogen into a chemical or fuel? And of course, that's what Top Suite does. And if you're thinking, yes, but can we not do it a little bit better? Then the killer application would of course be to combine them. And that solves a lot of your problem. Right now, to, to give you a short break uh, for my lecturing, and also because I am quite curious on which audience we have today. Then we have the first poll of the session. And here we would like you to pick one or more uh, of these options to really say how, which kind of projects do you see uh, within green hydrogen and what, how do you utilize green hydrogen? Thank you very much. So which projects does your company have or is developing currently within green hydrogen? So please check all that apply. You can choose more than one possible option. Option number one, green hydrogen for mobility. Option two, green hydrogen for e-fuels or low carbon fuels, refining use. Option number three, green hydrogen for ammonia or methanol. Option number four, green hydrogen for steel and finally, green hydrogen for other uses. So please feel free to check all that apply and share uh, your feedback, your opinion with us. So far about a third of you provided us with an answer. So we're gonna give another 20 seconds so we can have more participants sharing with us, providing us feedback. In about 10 seconds or so, we'll be closing this poll and we will be sharing the results of the poll with everybody. Okay, so thank you very much for your feedback. And these are the results. So 63% um, of the voters choose the option, both green hydrogen for e-fuels or low carbon fuels and green hydrogen for ammonia or methanol. And then coming in the second place is green hydrogen for other uses. Thank you, Cedric. I trust we're back uh, on the slideshow again, Cedric? Yes, we're back on the presentation. Sorry about that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. No worries. Well, thank you very much for those replies. I think um, that is actually very much in line with what we see in the market today. We see a lot of uh, projects on, on e-fuels, specifically on jet fuel, and we see a lot of the projects within ammonia methanol. We had a morning session of uh, this webinar as well, where we actually had a lot of mobility uh, projects. So that's a bit interesting to see how those differ across the, uh, the different regions. And maybe, uh, Christian, do you want to give a comment on, on how you sort of see ammonia methanol and, and how that works together with the solid oxide? E, no, but I'm rather cu curious what uh, the 42% that is green hydrogen for other uses. Uh, I would very much like to have some feedback uh, from your project to hear what what is that actually, because 42% is quite a lot. So yeah, that would be nice to know what kind of projects is out there. All right, then uh, we'll go with that. Then when we talk about a levelized cost of hydrogen, which is typically one of the metrics we use when we talk uh, electrolyzers, then that is uh, in many ways an extremely clear metric because it's the levelized cost of hydrogen, of course, and then we take that from the renewable cell sector where they use uh, the levelized cost of, of energy. What's a little bit, uh, what can make it difficult to talk levelized cost of hydrogen is that the industry or business or whatever we call it is still relatively young. So we have not really coalesced around how do we measure this in, a, in the same way. Um, and it's, it's just different from project to project and that, also, that always creates a little bit of confusion. So what we typically do to try and, and, and exemplify what high temperature electrolysis bring is to take that to a product level. Because ultimately a, a product level is something that, that is easier to relate to. Um, and in this case, we've chosen to do it for ammonia. And this slide doesn't say anything about the economics or costs. It's purely an energy-based slide. 
So for, for three ammonia plants, one conventional natural gas-fired ammonia plant, one green ammonia plant based on alkaline and, and one based on high temperature of the same size. We did sort of the calculations for this. And then on the left, you see for the conventional natural gas based ammonia plants, there you need an energy consumption of between 8.4 to 10.5 megawatt hours per metric ton ammonia produced. There is a range here because we've done that over a fleet of ammonia plants, old and, and new plants. And here we've sort of taken all the natural gas and converted it into megawatt hours, which is maybe a little bit unusual, but, but it works for comparison's sake. For the alkaline case, then you find you need approximately 10 megawatt hours per metric ton of ammonia produced. And for the high temperature case, you need approximately 7.5 megawatt hours per metric ton. And again, here I use the terms high temperature and SOEC, solid oxide, a little bit interchangeably. Uh, solid oxide is our version of the high temperature electrolysis. Now, the large drop in energy consumption you have in the high temperature case, that is uh, chiefly due to the high efficiency of the electrolyzer solution itself, but it is also partly due to how we integrate the electrolyzer into the ammonia plant. I won't go too much into details with this because it will be a long webinar once I start. Um, but one example of this is in the alkaline case, then the steam that you produce in the ammonia loop. So I'm producing ammonia as an exothermal reaction. It generates heat and we convert that heat into steam. That steam is sent to a turbine that drives a very large compressor. So this large compressor is partly driven by the turbine, partly by an electrical motor. In the high temperature case, that turbine is driven by a fully, fully by an electrical motor. And the steam produced in the ammonia loop is returned to the electrolysis section. And that is a more efficient use of those heat calories. So it gains you an efficiency gain in the complex itself. Right. So before we hand it over to Christian to talk more in detail on the electrolysis, then I'll give you a bit of a teaser for, uh, for a coming session we have on, on more dedicated to power to x in general. And for here, I will talk about um, these export projects, what we call them. It's when you look at the regions like Chile, Middle East, North Africa, Australia, that have a very low um, or very, very low cost renewable power available in remote locations, then the idea is typically you will erect a large amount of renewable generation assets and couple that to an ammonia plant. So these island mode projects, they typically have the challenge of how do you maintain the operation of a chemical plant with fluctuating power supply. And normally, of course, in the chemical plant is designed to operate at a fixed high plant load. That's what we have all been taught when we were young engineers. And that's what the engineers who taught us that were taught that when they were young engineers. Of course, the world changes and in an electrified uh, picture and especially in these island projects, then you really need a chemical plant that is able to do whatever the renewable generation assets tells it to do. So that's what we have done. We have redesigned the ammonia complex to allow for a fully dynamic operation. So very quick load changes, and it allows you to park the plant idle when there's no power and, and to quickly restart. So that gives you a very good, a very efficient way to produce ammonia. I think the, the reason for this design is not so much the energy efficiency and the OPEX, that is more on the electrolyzer side. Here it's CAPEX efficiency, because you, you save a lot of CAPEX on the renewable generation assets, the transmission and the storage by having a dynamic uh, solution. Of course, now you have a lot of ammonia, you ship that to Japan, Korea, North America, Europe, and then the ammonia is either used as co-firing for coal power plants, or it is cracked back to Hydrogen, and that's uh, it's funny how uh, it's kind of circular in our industry because back in the 70s, cracking ammonia to hydrogen was uh, all the rage in the nuclear wave. So we've taken the technology we had from back in those days where we supplied a number of quite large plants for this, and basically we plugged it in, put power to it to make it an electric electrical version of ammonia cracking. Again, I'll not go into too much detail with this. That's for a, a webinar that that's coming up. So to round up, what uh, the message we'd like to give is, 
that Topsy is a company that transforms uh, electricity, preferably renewable electricity, into a suit of chemicals and fuels available. And our main focus is doing this with very high efficiencies because we believe that renewable power is a resource we need to treat with care and be responsible in that. That being said, now let's hand it over to Christian so he can explain to you a little bit about how the SOC actually works. Christian. Thank you, Tor. And uh, first, I would like to say thank you to those of you who have let me know in the questions what other usage you have for uh, your hydrogen project. SOEC electrolysis is very much like low temperature electrolysis. You have a, a stack with a, with a lot of cells, uh, with an anode, a cathode, and a membrane. When you apply power to it, then oxygen is moved across the membrane and you have uh, hydrogen generated on one side and oxygen uh, generated on the other side. The main difference is that, that in SOEC, it all takes place in the gas phase. Uh, and the energy uh, needed to produce uh, the same amount of hydrogen is much lower with SOEC. If we look at the figure to the uh, to to the right, you can see that the electric energy that is needed in order to to crack uh, or to produce the hydrogen is much lower at about 700 to 800 uh, degrees compared to 60 degrees. And our SOEC the cells they are operating at around 750 degrees. Um, you can also see that uh, the reaction is uh, is endothermic, and therefore there is a heat demand to the process. And for SOEC, that heat demand is balanced by the over potential that we run our stacks with, and thereby uh, the over potential that is that you have to use when you do electrolysis is not. Um, that is um, that energy is saved because it's used for for uh, to 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 cover the energy demand, and that that is actually not completely possible for low temperature electrolysis. Um, so another side of uh, high temperature electrolysis is that uh, you can have quite high current densities, and the high current densities means that your unit becomes compact. Uh, and thereby less costly. Um, you can also increase the current densities with alkaline and PIM, but especially with alkaline, it comes with a, 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 a relatively high cost because when you increase your current densities a little bit, then the over potential or the voltage that you need to produce hydrogen goes up and thereby you lose a lot of energy. Uh, so with SO, SOEC, you get a um, a lower capex because the, the equipment is smaller, but you also save on the OPEX on the energy uh, that is required for, uh, for the electrolysis. So if we sum it up in round numbers, uh, then I have made these, prepared these bars uh, for production of hydrogen in kilowatt hours per normal cubic meter. And you see that there is a fixed portion roughly half a kilowatt hour that is used for the plant itself. So that's is pumps and electrical systems and all sorts of different things that you need in order to have a plant uh, outside the uh, outside the stack. That is the same for alkaline as it is for SOEC. When we then look at the electrolyzer itself, then the energy that is required to produce one cubic meter of hydrogen is much less with SOC, and that is due to what we talked about before, that we operate at the high temperature, and therefore the uh, thermodynamics favors uh, the, uh, the high temperature electrolysis. And then finally, there is a half a normal cube, or half a kilowatt hour that is used for evaporation of water. And even though that you can say that uh, you are not boiling water uh, when 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 you do alkaline or PIM, then th you still have to pay this energy price when you go from liquid water to hydrogen gas. Um, and in SOEC, we operate in the gas phase, but we have we actually have the possibility at least to save electricity to to generate the 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 steam, and that is because our 
our stacks, they are fed with steam, but that steam can be produced by another source than electricity. So for instance, if you have a nearby plant or the electrolyzer is integrated with a chemical plant, then it's possible to, to use waste heats from those plants and then use that directly in the SOEC unit. Um, in many cases, uh, chem in, in chemical plants, then these kind of waste streams or uh, such as steam is used to produce power. Uh, so if you can if you can avoid producing power and then go back to 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 steam again, then there is a huge uh, saving in energy. So what kind of processes do we work with uh, in relation to SOEC? Topsoil license a lot of different uh, different processes uh, for power to X. And one of them is, for instance, um, methanation uh, for producing RNG or SNG, uh, where hydrogen is reacted with CO2 or CO to, for, to form methane. This is a hydro exothermal process, and in these processes, you produce a lot of uh, a lot of steam that is very suitable for the SOEC. Then there are those uh, plants where you need both CO and, 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 and hydrogen, uh, such as methanol reactors uh, and also fissiotroph reactors. It is also exothermal uh, reactions where the waste heat is typically recovered as steam. This steam can also be used for, for the SOC in order to keep the electricity um, uh, demand as low as possible. And then finally, as Tor mentioned before, we have the possibility to integrate an ammonia loop with the, our SOC technology. So the, the waste heat from the ammonia loop is used uh, to, to evaporate the water that we use in the SOC unit. And thereby, you can have a fully electric uh, ammonia plant. Then, uh, as Tor just mentioned, or he mentioned a little earlier, we have done a lot of work with our ammonia plants, especially uh, in order to, to prepare them for a future where they do not operate at 100% capacity 24-7 all year round. But we are curious, uh, we are looking into uh, how we should uh, change or modify our, our other processes in order to, to, to be ready for more fluctuating uh, operations. So we are curious how how do you how is the power for your project is it is it uh, is there a limitation on power or is it uh, is it so that the price just goes up but you will always have power or are you on an island where you, it's only sun so there will be you know that there will be no power during night so please let us know uh, how it is for your project Thank you, Christian so we will give about a minute or less to the audience to give us their feedback. How does your company see electricity supply develop for your projects? Please check all that apply. Option number one, stable power availability but with fluctuating price. Option number two, stable power availability with fixed price. Option number three, fluctuating power supply with interruptions. And finally, fluctuating power supply without interruptions. So you can choose more than one option. And so far, about a third of the participant provided us with our vote. We're gonna give you another 20 seconds that we can have more than half of the participants giving us a feedback. More than one uh, option is available and you can choose all four of them or a few of them. Okay, so about half of the people provided us with an answer. I'm gonna give another five seconds and then I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. Thank you so much for participating. And the results are the following. 47% of the voters choose fluctuating power supply with interruptions. Then 35% of the voters choose stable power availability but with fluctuating price. 31% of the voters choose stable power availability with fixed price. And finally, about one out of five voters choose fluctuating power supply without interruptions. Yeah, thank you for the answers. I think it was 
a little bit like expected. Uh, before this morning's uh, event, I, I expected uh, maybe only that two of them will be dominating, but, uh, but now I learned that there are so many different scenarios uh, from region to region, from project to project, that we will have to adapt for everything. I think it's uh, interesting. Do you have a comment, Tor? Well, I, I feel vindicated a little bit, right? Because I tend to come to you with all these different types of projects and, uh, and I, you know, because that's what we see basically. <laughs> but I think the reason we see this is that at least in this first wave of projects, the projects that tend to get off the ground and tend to get a lot of momentum, they are the projects that are able to really take full advantage of the, of the you can say, local or regional advantages they have in that local framework then, then they are able to develop their projects. And I think this this shows that that's just very different from, from region to region. Thank you, Tor. So now I'll just move on to how we came to where we are today with our SOEC technology. So Topsoe started in 1981, looking into solid oxide cells but that was for the purpose of developing fuel cells. And we did a lot of work within this field until 2011. We were successful in, in terms of developing a robust solution for fuel cells based on SOEC or SOFC. Um, however, uh, we also saw that the market for SOFC plants didn't really take off. So therefore we decided to look into SOEC uh, and reuse the, the stacks and the cells that we have developed over 30 years. Uh, what, what we did is that we, we, we looked into or we targeted in the niche market for production of carbon monoxide uh, because this is a market where the prices are high, uh, in, uh, high, uh, high, uh, high quality CO is important. Uh, and 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 there is a pro a problem of by transporting CO over longer distances, especially if if, if it's larger amounts. Um, so what we, you see here that is uh, that is uh, a container solution, uh, and inside the containers we have grouped some stacks in a hot box. We call it a core, with uh, where uh, where the CO2 is coming in and, and CO is coming out. Uh, it operates like a hydrogen at about 750 degrees. Um, it works more or less the same as hydrogen uh, or water electrolysis. We feed uh, CO2 to the, to the solid oxide cell. We apply power and oxygen is transported uh, through a membrane and we have a mixture of CO and CO2 uh, leaving the, uh, the stacks. Then we separate the CO2 from the CO and we reuse the uh, CO2 in the, in the cells again. And thereby we can produce a very high purity CO. Uh, it has also a different contaminants uh, compared to CO produced from a, a, a reformer. So what you can see here on this picture, uh, on, on uh, the picture below, that is uh, an example of one of these plants is one of two uh, 750 kilowatt uh, plants that we have delivered in the United States. Uh, it's operating quite smoothly. But besides, uh, besides SOEC for, for, for CO, we have also, we also started to look into SOECs for other applications among those uh, also water electrolysis. And what you see on the picture to the right, uh, that is a plant that was developed in order to upgrade biogas to natural gas, so that the biogas uh, that is typically low, uh, low uh, the biogas plants that are located in the countryside, they could sell their biogas in the natural gas grid and thereby sell it all over Europe. And that was done by by converting the CO2 in the biogas into methane by adding uh, hydrogen from a solid oxide electrolyzer and then doing methanation. So 
we also realized uh, that there will be a time where we will move away from small pilot and demonstration plants or, or chemical plants for ultra pure uh, CO. And therefore, a few years ago, we started to develop uh, our SOSD stack 2.0, uh, a stack that was targeted for the double digit and triple digit megawatt uh, size of plants. And that is actually what we are working on today. So we do not, uh, do not any longer pursue anything with our first generation stacks. And what you see here, that is a, a rendering of a 20 megawatt uh, hydrogen plant. Uh, the, gray, the gray boxes that you see in the forefront, there are three and a half of them. That is uh, electrolysis modules. So that's the electrolyzer stacks and power, and power electronics and piping. Then you have a pipe rack, that's a blue one, to distribute gases for all the electrolyzer module. The white building on the, on the left, no, on the right side, that is shoot example, a transformer station and switch gears. And on the other side, then the big white building that is for blowers and compressors. And we also have two vessels uh, that should, um, that, uh, that is used for drying of the hydrogen. The small equipment that you see in the forefront that is for, for heat generation or heat generation in, in terms of making steam, and then as some uh, heat exchangers to recover heat from the process. And thereby we go back to you, Tor. Thank you, Christian. A small summation of, uh, or a small recap of what we've been talking about. Of course, any high temperature process is slightly more tricky compared to low temperature processes. That's the way it is. So initially, why would you do, why would you do a high temperature process? Well, again, here, that's basically the efficiency. Um, so, and sort of to underline that or to highlight that, you can say, Currently, we are involved in a project where the project developer is considering whether to, to build a 100 megawatt alkaline solution to supply the necessary hydrogen, or alternatively to go with a roughly 80 megawatt high temperature solution for, for the same, same amount of hydrogen. So here you say the same amount of hydrogen with, with significantly less electricity or just more hydrogen with the same amount of electricity. Then. Is a SOEC is a metal ceramic glass based uh, technology, and here we are able to leverage sort of the existing value chain within ceramics. Uh, it's not exactly the same uh, down to the details, but the production mechanisms and the supply chain uh, are ba basically the same. So, so that's a very uh, good way to to scale on. We don't use any of these very uh, difficult materials to get, so we feel comfortable in that aspect. And lastly, it's a lot about hydrogen at the moment, but high temperature electroly electrolysis also gives you the ability to work with carbon dioxide. So to use carbon dioxide as a raw material to the whole chain of carbon containing chemicals and fuels. And there's a, we, we see a lot of interest in this currently with jet fuel uh, and also with, with methanol and methanol derivatives and, and substitutions that way around. Then, for the uh, last part of the webinar, we will take uh, a Q&A session from, uh, thank you very much for, for putting in a lot of questions. We will see how many we can manage. I would ideally like to finish uh, five minutes uh, before the hour to give everybody uh, the opportunity to just uh, raise themselves from the chairs and, and have a cup of coffee or something before the next team Zooms meeting. So um, kicking off with some of the questions here. Um, we had a question come in uh, about water, about water also being a significant resource, uh, not just electricity. And, and that's, of course, completely correct. If you are to make uh, hydrogen via electrolysis, you need, you need water to supply that hydrogen. And, and that's one of these things that I think that we see, uh, maybe not now, but we will see in the middle of the next wave. That's when you take advantage of some of these local conditions you have, because at some places in the world, it's going to be difficult to get that water, or at least you're going to need energy to get that water. 
and other places will have a competitive advantage uh, with the water supply. And there's, there's more details on that, of course, but uh, we'll leave that for now. Then I have, uh, we have another question um, here that uh, I think this may be for you, Christian. How do we design for reliability if the processes are so integrated, uh, i.e. methanation, methanol, uh, or ammonia plants? So what uh, what we have done is that we have we have made uh, dynamic models of, uh, for instance, the ammonia plant, and we have looked into what kind of changes that we should do in order to make sure that uh, the ammonia plant not collapses, so to say, from an operation point of view, uh, if the power, for instance, disappears uh, quite fast. And 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 it turned out that it is actually not that difficult. Uh, to handle these uh, situations. In terms of uh, if, if we're talking about uh, methanation, then I would expect that um, um, that could also be done. It, it, it might be that we will go away from adiabatic reactors, but then use boiling water reactors instead of, uh, because, because they are much more robust towards shutting down and starting up uh, or going to low load. Good. Um, the next question we have here, uh, how can the SOEC handle changes in electricity availability? Can it handle several startup shutdowns per day? And the very boring answer is yes. Um, the more detailed answer is, of course, that is extremely important when you do dynamic operations. And the SOEC, just like uh, low temperature, we take the electrolyzer system and it's divided into sections, subsection, modules, and so forth. So really you have two different ways to manage the load. Here you can either take sections out or you can reduce capacity in individual sections. So the whole load controlling mechanism is, is very important here. And the more visibility you have on what you expect in the future, the easier it is to handle these load changes. And as long as you, you can say you do them in a proper way, it's not an issue for the lifetime of the uh, electrolysis system. What you of course can run into in these cases is that the the facility shuts down in a safety interlock and you have to, to restart, right? But that's a protective mechanism. So let's see, there is, uh, maybe this is for you, Christian. How much power is required to convert carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide using your SOEC process? Yeah, uh, roughly seven, seven kilowatt hour per normal cubic meter. That is a short question. Or maybe short answer, you, yeah. yeah. Maybe you could go slightly into detail to how that power is distributed across the plant. Sorry, once again, Tor. No, I was more saying that the electrolysis operation itself, uh, as far as I remember, consumes pretty much the same amount of power as the hydrogen um, mm -hmm. production. And the remainder of the power then goes in these isolated plants to run the balance of plant and to run the, the uh, gas purification and everything. And, and maybe we should also add that this number is based on smaller plants and, 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 and it would be more efficient when we go to megawatt size. Um, yeah. Good. Then there is another one here. Um, if I can find it, it, it uh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, but basically there is a question on here, how do we see the commercialization timeline of electrolysis uh, 2.0? And I would say that's, that's, that's roughly now. Uh, we have uh, several uh, contracts under negotiation. Uh, the only one we have so far made public is a 300 ton per day uh, green ammonia plant uh, located in Germany. And we have a number of uh, smaller projects, let's say 20 to 50 megawatt, uh, where we have been selected as a supplier. And we have yet to conclude the agreements and make them public. And we have a number of uh, larger contracts, these I would say 80 to 200 megawatt, um, where in principle we have been selected, but these projects, they still have some way to go to final investment decision and financial closure. So, you know, of course the uncertainty is larger in these projects. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, I'm scrolling like crazy here. Um, 
let's say uh, this one, Christian. Can you use the steam from other processes directly as the feed to the SOEC, or does it need to be treated purified? What purity is acceptable? So it uh, it depends on the quality of the steam. In general, I will say that we can use uh, steam that is has been that comes from a high pressure turbine and high pressure boilers. Uh, lower grade steam will need some treatment, but that would be something that we will do. Yep. Yeah. Then we have a question here on the steam temperature. Uh, the question goes, uh, let's see, okay, no, uh, the question goes something like, uh, if the steam is only 450 degrees Celsius, how does that uh, get used in a high temperature electrolysis where the temperatures are typically higher, 700 to 800 degrees Celsius? Uh, and that's, uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, we get that a lot. And when we design uh, these high temperature systems, then you can say what we accept at the battery limit is typically low pressure saturated steam or it's a low grade waste heat, say 160 to 200 degrees Celsius, which then we either use the low pressure steam or the heat to generate low pressure steam. And this low pressure steam is then fed into the hot zone. And then out of the hot zone, you have the, uh, the warm gases around 200, 250 degrees Celsius, which we then make heat recovery on. So essentially the electrolysis system has a low grade heat recovery and it has a, a high grade heat recovery system where we, we maintain the high temperatures inside the electrolysis and we recover that heat and circulate it, circulate it through heat exchangers. That is basically the key to achieving uh, these high efficiencies. And if you, if you mix the two temperature zones, then uh, that is, uh, you pay a price on the efficiency for that. I think we can just have a couple of more before we end. Um, we have one here. Um, what is the delivery pressure from the SOEC stack, Christian? Yeah, so uh, our stacks, they operate at about two bars. Um, and if we just come back to this thing about the, the steam temperature and the steam pressure, then what is actually required, that is saturated steam at about uh, four, four and a half bar and then upwards, that is good enough, so to say, for our units. And uh, the hydrogen leaving our unit uncompressed is roughly one and a half bar G. Thank you. Then we have a question here on what is uh, our expected uh, delivery capacity per year. Um, and there we are uh, constructing a, a factory for this. And that is, has an initial capacity of 500 megawatts per year. Uh, so, I mean, a, an output of uh, stacks per year corresponding to a 500 megawatt electrolyzer. And that uh, will be ramped up in the following years when we do the bottlenecking. And that should come on stream uh, towards the end of 2023. And Christian, I think we have a question here on um, on producing uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide simultaneously. Yeah, I have also seen them. There are actually a lot of questions about doing what we call co-electrolysis, and that is where you feed both water and CO2 into uh, into the SOEC unit to produce a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And that is possible. Uh, right now, we are only doing uh, CO2 and water electrolysis separately. We have, with our first generation stack, done what we call co-electrolysis. And that is also something that we will start looking at uh, again in the new future. future in the near future, um, I think we will have a demo plant up and running within a year or something like that. Thank you. Then there is a number of questions that I would try to roll into one here. Uh, it's about the degradation rate and the cost of the uh, of per megawatt of the electrolyzer. So. The degradation rate, if I start with that, um, there is of course degradation in, in these cells, but due to how you balance out the heat and the electricity itself to the electrolyzer stack, then the, you can say electricity consumption on a plant level per kg of hydrogen remains constant 
across the stack lifetime. So the degradation you see in the stack, that generates heat, and that is offset by the, the heat recovery. So basically, we shift the electrical duty around inside. I mean, that's a very short answer, right? Uh, um, then on the, the costs and everything, then we uh, believe, and that's also the feedback we get from the market, that we are competitive on a liberalized cost uh, basis. Uh, it is, of course, a young technology compared to especially alkaline. And even though we have been working with it for many years, so we offer this on a long-term service agreement type of contract uh, for 10 years or, or whatever we end up with, where Topsuit guarantees the energy consumption per kg of hydrogen and the production capacity and product purity. And then we take the responsibility for the hot part of the electrolysis and we uh, then assume the the costs for stack replacement uh, and hot zone care. So in essence, what we're trying to do is take as much technical risk away from the customer and give the customer a fixed conversion fee. And the electricity price, the customer has to hedge, right? But the cost involved in converting the electricity to, to the hydrogen, that's what we want to fix for our customers. And we take the lifetime and the technical risk on our shoulders. Christian, have you found the one you would like to answer, or do you want me to shake the bag again? No, uh, I have found one here that I would like to answer. That is, um, there's a question about the purity uh, of the hydrogen that is produced uh, by SOEC, and and um, the purity is comparable to uh, to what you can expect from PIM and uh, and alkaline. The main difference is that because it, SOC operates at so high temperature, then there will be no oxygen in the in the hydrogen. It will simply react with hydrogen immediately at 750 degrees. Um, then there will be a little bit, so the impurity that we have, that's a little bit of uh, nitrogen that comes from diffusion through the cells. That's the only thing that we have, but otherwise comparable with alkaline and PIM. Then again, I'll, I'll group a couple of questions. We have several questions on the lifetime, plant lifetime, and on um, this high temperature electrolysis is, is more efficient from an energy consumption, but low temperature is more robust. And there's also some questions on stack lifetime. So if we sort of pull that into to one broad answer, then when we design these plants, we design them for refinery and chemical use. So the plant lifetime is typically 25 years. That's sort of the, the, the normal design life uh, criteria for, for large projects. The stack lifetime itself is, of course, not 25 years. Um, I think it's fair to say that the high temperature is not at the stage yet where it is the same robustness as low temperature. So we can't achieve these eight years of lifetime, but we do get uh, pretty close. And of course, ultimately, what we then do, as I said, is we offer this on a long-term service contract and really the reason we like that reasoning behind it because it you know we stand by our technology and it aligns the incentives for the customer and us very well the customer would like a plant to run smoothly and efficiently and and in this case we really really want that because uh, we are the ones who bear the cost if it doesn't so i think we can take one more christian if, if you have a last one uh yes which one should i pick um boom 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 yeah there are a lot of questions uh actually about impurities uh how sensitive uh the socs stacks they are to impurities and um the socs is made out of all the stacks and the, the the main thing is nickel just like in our reformers and like Reformers, we for those when 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 you reform methane, you add a lot of steam, so it's very comparable to what our at least our experience from reforming can very well be used for SOC. And I think we have the tools in place in order for us to guarantee that there won't be a, a problem with the impurities that leads to degradation of our uh, stack. Uh, and there are a lot. There are actually also specific. Uh, questions to which quality and uh, of water that is required and if it's the same quality as for alkaline and 
for those specs that I have seen, it's exactly the same as for alkaline or the quality of the water that is required. Um, yeah. Good. Thank you. Then, thank you very much for spending an hour of your day with us. That we deeply appreciate that. I hope you felt a little of the love creep out through the screens. And uh, then we will end here to give you time to stretch your legs before the next meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>